In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Psalm 34, verse 8. Uh, we'll pray a bit more. Psalm 34, verse 8. The Bible says, Oh, taste and see. Psalm 34 and verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The, the invitation here is, it's very interesting, especially when you look at the context. You are invited to taste and to see that the Lord is good. This is something very, very personal. There's a very personal, intimate dimension to the instruction in this verse. And I want you to see how it proceeds. It says, blessed is the man that trusts in him, so that the blessedness that the Bible speaks about here is for those that trust in him, but it does appear that tasting and seeing that the Lord is good is almost a precondition to trusting him. There is something that when you have tasted of the Lord, it enhances, it, if you like, it almost incentivizes trust. It incentivizes your trust. And I want to pray in a moment, I want us to pray in a moment of time. This is not, it's a prayer that uh, I feel the Lord needs for us to pray. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So, if you have not tasted, if you have not tasted, and how do you taste the Lord? How do you taste so that you might see that the Lord is good? The Bible is talking here about personal encounter. It's talking about that thing that is not transferable. You see, if you have never had, um, if you never tasted lemon in your life, you could never send somebody to help you know the taste of something. Right? Like, I've heard so much about honey. I've heard so much about honey. But I'm not disposed to, and I hear they, they, they are tasting honey, you know, down the street. I'm not disposed. I'd have loved to go personally, but I want to know what honey tastes like. And so you send your honey. <laughs> All right? So, so you send your spouse to go down the street to taste it for you. By the time your spouse is gone and tasted it and the spouse is back, your situation has not improved. <laughs> because there are certain things, there are certain things that cannot be done for you behind your back. One of them is tasting, tasting, tasting. So whatever it is that God is doing in this season, I want you to find a space where it is you and the Lord alone. Like, I, I, I want my hands to be in this. I want my face to be in this. I want my life to be in this. I'm excited and I thank you for everything that you have done for me through others. But there are certain things that cannot be transmitted. There are certain things you can't come into by secondhand experience. Tasting and seeing that the Lord is good is one of those things. So that you get to that point in your life when you wake up in the morning and maybe you bump into someone and they give you all the reasons to not believe any of the things you believe anymore. And you have not a reason that you can give that might be intellectually satisfying for why you would insist on believing the things you believe. And then you're going to say to them, at the reason level, it does seem like you have the edge. The, the unfortunate thing is, I tasted something. And there's no way you can convince me out of what I have tasted. He is good. He is good. He's good. The songwriter says, I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. 
There's something that the Lord can bring you into that will lock you, it will lock you, and it's important for where we're going this day. It will lock you into a place of persuasion from which you can never be dissuaded. That is to say that it wouldn't matter what is going on out there. The point would be, I tasted, I tasted. I, I, I know, I know, like I know my name, that he is good. It is that tasting that will help you to trust. And there's a blessedness that is pronounced upon them that trust the Lord. So I want you to take a few, uh, we're going to take a few minutes. And you just want to pray that the Lord will win you. W-E-A-N, that the Lord will separate you from everything good in their places that are becoming, uh, gradually becoming a replacement for that personal encounter that is supposed to be the bedrock of much of what happens in your life in the spirit. Sometimes it can even be the fact that we come together like this and some of us can no longer find God unless we are in a corporate uh, 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 fellowshipping uh, 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 setting or we are in this kind of prayer place and Everything now, it looks like this is the, the major thing in your life. Now it looks like the thing that happens in public or the thing that happens when we come as a corporate people. And so it almost as if your faith feeds off of the fervency of other people. Like, you know, the way I see everybody else go about this thing, it has to be real. If it isn't real, people cannot be this excited about nothing. So it has to be real so that your faith is incidental upon other people's fervency. But the psalmist is inviting you to come personally, to taste personally, and to affirm personally that he is good. I want you to pray this afternoon. I want you to ask that the Lord will put himself at your disposal. Huh? That the Lord will put himself at your disposal. Like that let my life, may the Lord not be allergic to me. That's, that's the kind of thing I'm saying. That the Lord will put himself at your disposal. Can we pray? Can we pray? Taste and see. Taste and see. I want to take chunks of God if there was such a thing. I, 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 want, to, I, want, to, I want to drill into God. I want to dive into him. I want to handle this, the, 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 the beloved apostle said that which our eyes have seen, that which our ears have heard, that which we have looked upon and which we have handled of the word of life. The same, the same. Taste and see, taste and see. That there's a luscious reality in the spirit, taste and see. Mina ko de laski brefete nagabo. Leprekoski betali gidanati akute skaboma. Areske felemanda kabru keteli manatai. Obreske panatale monko benina tuakai tele minamba. Abrana tasele mon pepa. Ireske falina kutele menaskabo. Yeliminati sele mon baradabana moko bele menatai. Ombreske felani teala monatabe. I manata so zela monatu ke pela. Ye preteske parati ke palamo. Oh Lord, I want you to be personal with me. I want you to be personal with me. I don't want the, 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 the heart of my spirituality to be predicated on other people's experiences and other people's fervency and other people's testimony. I want to taste for myself. Put yourself at my disposal, oh God. For if you hide yourself, who might find you? Let something fresh begin. Let something intimate. Let something personal. Lord, put yourself at my disposal. Help me. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. To see you as you are. To handle you for whom you are. 
to touch you, to feel you, to experience you. Alenaske brufele nama monte tanatala mo ma paratene talamina tua ebrene talame ma poratina tai se se alamo nante kabe ariske felimina ti se sebe a brufele ne mama nuana naite lai mombe nante marande naite nonko pene nante la mambra bobo bonde dende limina tambo mama. Abremo mono tela mantile mina te sima. Ay mi mame na tele mina tua mamande. Ambre fananta sami mon pelambe mama adia. Ay de naite naite mo mon papara. A pene talamina kuate ne ne kopela. Ima mine na se sai. Ay mi tatale mono toma. A pomo motu mame. A pe mi mamuata nai. Ay te naito mi. Ni sabe abri ne se sami mo te tai abra na tali mom pe pe ni nantabo o pe na salimi ni ti a te milamo te milamo ne na te bela na sabo. Hmm. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appears before the Lord. Everyone, 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 every one of them, every one of them in Zion appears before the Lord. I lemenas cobra telamona. I mama sola. <laughs> ah, Jesus, the place you are, <laughs> the secret place, that's where I want to be. Take me to the place, the place you are, the secret place, that's where I want to be, oh take me to the place. The place you are, the secret place, that's where I want to be, that's where I want to be, take me Jesus, bring me to the place. Where it is my Lord and I. Where it is my Lord and I. Where it is my Lord and I. Oh, the pure delight of a singular that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee my god i come in as friend with friend draw me nearer nearer blessed lord to the cross where thou hast died Draw me nearer Nearer, blessed Lord To thy precious bleeding side I am thine, I am thine, O oh Lord, and I've heard thy voice. And 
when he told thy love to me. But I long to rise, everybody say. But I long to in the arms of faith. In the arms of and be closer drawn to you. Closer drawn to draw me nearer. Nearer, nearer, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw, draw, draw me near. The pure delight of a single hour. Oh, the pure delight of a single that before thy throne I spend. Throne I. When I kneel in prayer, when I kneel in prayer, and we commune I commune as friend we draw me nearer yes Jesus Two more times. Draw me nearer. Draw me Jesus. Draw me Jesus. Draw me nearer. Draw me nearer. Just bleeding one more time. Draw me, draw me, draw me near. to your precious 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 bleeding side many na seli bo fele motadi ala boros kefala lord i ask that you will close whatever gap exists between my soul and your person by your mercy and your grace close the gap close the gap close the gap I want to see you. I want to know you. I want to touch you. I want to feel you. I want to handle you. You say, taste and see. Yes, I want to taste. I want to taste. I want to taste your reality. I'm tired of the shadows. 
I want to taste reality, reality, reality. Bring me close. Bring me close. your grace so I can live your days I want to see you oh God say I want to see you Lord I ask that everyone whose heart truly desires you Lord, I ask that we more than respond to the cry of each of our hearts. Wherever we are with you, things can be a lot better. And so, Lord, tonight I ask that you will come for me. That you will come for my brothers and sisters. Right here in this house and out there online, we want to see you, Jesus. Lord, we ask that you distract us away from our distractions. Attract us away from our attractions. That you alone might exhaust our vision. In the name of Jesus. The psalmist said, I have desired you more than my necessary need. What you do to men to bring them to such place of intensity and devotion to you. Jesus, increasingly do to us also. We in our hearts, we in our love, we in our affections, oh, all to you. Show us your face. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You may sit. We'll still pray. It's a prayer meeting. It's a prayer meeting. I'd like for you to try by all means possible to listen to me with a heart of faith and with prophetic ears. Psalm 56. Psalm 56. And we'll read probably just a verse or two. It's a very beautiful psalm to read. But I want to read verses 8 and 9. More about verse 8. The Bible says, Thou tellest my wanderings. Is it okay if I step down here? All right, thank you. Thou tellest my wanderings. Thou tellest my wanderings. Hear me with a heart of faith and ears 
or prophets, prophetic ears. Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? There is there's so much that the psalmist is piling upon God here. You tell my wanderings, right? He says, you tell my wanderings, put my tears. And he didn't just say put, he said, put thou my tears. You who can tell my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. And then he says, are they not in your book? Thou tellest my wandering. I want to give you uh, both an instruction and possibly to share with you a wisdom. That as long as we live in this world for different kinds of reasons, we will, you know, intermittently, intermittently we will be brought to the point of tears. Sometimes it's tears of joy, right? And sometimes they are genuine tears of frustration. The Bible says that weeping may endure for the night and joy comes in the morning. There was a point in the life of Jesus where even Jesus said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful to the point of death. And at the tomb of a friend, the Bible says, Jesus wept. So I'd like for you to know that there is a sense in which as long as you are on this side of the divide, tears might be inevitable. Sometimes there are tears in the place of intercession. And in fact, there will be some of you under the sound of my voice tonight that one of the miracles God does for you in this prayer meeting is the restoration of your prayer tears. Your heart has grown cold and frigid and you have lost the tenderness that was your heart in the place of supplication, intercession and in the place of petition because, because when the spirit of God that helps our infirmity, when it begins to make groanings that cannot be uttered, sometimes those groanings, they are fertilized by the tears of the prayer. If that's such a word, I don't know. Uh, somebody who prays is what? A prayer. Yes. We can agree on it. And we use language. Language doesn't use us. All right? <laughs> language was made for man. Man was not made for language. All right? Someone who plays is a player. Someone who prays. Huh? It's a prayer. Now, it, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and there are some of us, you know, because there's a certain misconception by which people think that masculinity, even if they're talking about godly masculinity, there's a sense in which people think that godly masculinity excludes you and it takes you away from the realm of tears and emotion. Even God himself opens his arms. And when you read in the book of Ezekiel, you could tell the tenderness with which the heart of the father bleeds as he calls for those that have gone wayward. And one of the most masculine men you will find in all of the Old Testament was the warrior David himself. Yet, tough as David was, that was also how tender David was. Because where the lion is, the lion is not where the lamb is the lamb. And whereas you could be the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus was and is. The same Jesus is the lamb of God. And those are not exactly the same kind of disposition. You will not expect that if you are a lion, you would be a lamb. But he is at once the lion and at once the lamb. It, Jesus Christ, by implication, it means Jesus does not roar when he's before the father. Are you with me? <laughs> and then when Jesus is in Judah, he's not looking for protection. He's a lion. But he's a lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's the lamb. But he's what? The lamb of God. He's not the lamb of Judah. And he's not the lion of God. By construction. That means it is possible for you to, sus to sustain dispositions that might appear to be very contradictory and exactly opposite to each other depending on context. No man was designed by God to be macho everywhere. 
Thou tellest my wanderings. Let's get back so I can bring you to the point of prayer. Because the hand of the Lord will be bringing a lot of correctives. God will be helping people to reclaim and to regain time that was lost. And God will help you after now to know how to take the most, to make the most of circumstances and situations in your life. My prayer is that after tonight, you will not shed a tear that will be wasted anymore. Amen. Thou tellest my wanderings. The man who is speaking here is obviously therefore saying that there's a sense in which he has wandered. He's been a wanderer. A wanderer. Now, this is, of course, you understand wandering here. It's like someone who is just going about aimlessly. 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 Wandering. That's the idea. And the man says, but God, you can tell my wanderings. So when David is running from pillar to post, and he's going from cave to mountain, and it looks like it's a zigzag motion. There's almost, there's no sequence. There's no rhythm to it. At least that's what he will think. Today he's in the stronghold of Adulam. Tomorrow he's in Sheila. And then just as about, he's about, as about, he's about to settle in. Then the news comes that Saul has heard that you are here. Then David goes before the Lord and says, is Saul going to come to this place? And the Lord says, yes. When Saul comes here with the men of this city, hand me over to Saul. The Lord said, yes. Ah, so what happens? David gathers, he, he's, he takes off again. But you know what? David says, oh God, you tell my wandering. That is to say, the thing that is wandering as I wander around on your own end of the equation, you are the only one that can make sense of it. You can tell it. You can tell it. I only wonder, but you can tell it. You still don't get it. You will get it. It means that God is the only one that can make sense of that which appears to be pointless, directionless in your life. God actually knows what it is. God is telling. God, you may be wondering, but God can tell it. God is not a, a collaborator between your ignorance. He can tell even when you are wondering. You wonder here, you wonder there, you wonder here, you wonder there. And it's like the emotion of a drunk. Huh? But like a wise man says, God writes straight with crooked lines. He can tell your wondering. And you might be here and when you look back the last 15 years, you cannot, you, you cannot make sense of the journey of your life, apart from the fact that your hairline is receding. Right? You can see, right? And I, you, you know, it, it, it's like, what else have I achieved? Apart from the fact that my hairline is receding and it's turning gray, in, you know, here and there, what else? Have I achieved? And there is even a temptation for you to withdraw into your shell and begin to exhibit symptoms of depression. But can I tell you tonight, on the other side of the equation, there is one that can tell it. Thou tellest my wanderings. You tell my wanderings. And the day that God finally decides to tell your wandering to the world, it will suddenly make sense. Like, whoa, is that what he was doing all the while? And it will be, yes. This is what he's been doing. This is what he's been doing. It was while that man had given up upon ministry. Once upon a time, he was fired up. We are going to do great things for God. We'll emancipate the people of God. And he, he actually tried his hands. Oh, and if ever there was a failure in ministry, count Moses in. He failed so miserably that he, he relocated. You understand? And he didn't move from one side of the country to the other. He he. He jackpot in Nigeria. Like he left the he left the country as a whole. 
and went somewhere else, and he didn't go there to try his hands again. He, he, their hands had been so burnt that the man would not attempt to put them on the plow of ministry anymore. He, he changed location, changed vocation. He became a header of cattle. Huh? If ministry cannot work, if ministry will not work, my fathers were cattle rearers. There's something we know how to do where I come from. It's not compulsory. So the man had, he had psyched himself. And I began to live like a natural man. Yet the totems of God had pronounced differently upon him. And the eyes of the all-seeing one watches him. And as he was doing all of that, God was telling a story. God could tell his wandering. Because somewhere on that pathway was a burning bush at which history literally, literally turned for the Jewish people. He was just leading cattle, leading cattle. That journey of 40 years, huh? it, it was in God's economy. It was a straight line that led to life underneath that superficial, boisterous raging of the waves. There's a story underneath. Huh? He's untampered with, he's unruffled, because he's leading somewhere. Thou tellest my wandering. I want you to take two minutes and I want you to celebrate the one who can tell your wandering. You know, there are things you don't know about yourself. But you must take solace tonight in the fact that you serve a God that can tell it. Can, can you, can you, can you, can you, can you go to him in two minutes? Thou tellest my wandering. And I'm happy to leave it so for as long as you choose. Mila neko telaitesa. Breneshe selimo kobela manatiga. Mambre katela momba baya tamila. Mimama tarana tuabela mo. Aria saseile me kote bala. Oh God of creation. You tell my wandering. Yes. Yes. I have been like a nomad. But you can tell. You can tell. You can tell. I may be blind to it. I may be ignorant of what it is that you do. But thou tellest. You tell my wandering. Melani sele mokobe. Le fatali makotabai. Merande se kaite alamo so sela 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 ya katamila ateso melatwa brananko felande ande sayake natai momoyote sasale thou tellest my wandering it's my wandering but you tell it you tell it you tell it. The thing that looks aimless is so clear before you. You can tell. You can tell. You can tell. While I am wondering, you can tell. It's like 20% loaded. Loaded, loaded, loaded. Then when I cry again, you say oh, 30% loading, loading. It's still loading. It's loading. And we're going somewhere. You tell my wandering. You tell my wandering. Oh, I'm happy that I have a God that can tell things I cannot tell. Morati tela gutia na gobere na tuama. Mambro kota sasi ko feli katwa. Brelene mokopia tai. I'm sorry for every time that I have thought that my vision is the most accurate. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for where I might have accused you of irresponsibility over my life. It may be chaotic, but you can tell. 
Lord, tonight I am glad that I have a God that can tell. The untellable things of my life, you tell them. The untellable things of my life, you tell them, you tell them, you tell my wandering. Kaleni tetaile mo fetamo na kuapo de malami. Ove naske brofo toske feli katumo muhuba. A brofo ske veve ligi biatama. O boyo tuakute lomo pa. Mures kapami mo popa. A rasa sai pa. Tuakute tai mo papa. Yetene tine nina amomo. Yone ko belamina tuakabo. You tell my wandering. You tell my wandering. Oh Lord, you are a shield for me. You're my glory and the lift are up of my head. For thou, oh Lord, for thou. Oh Lord, you are a shield for me. My glory, my glory, the lifter up of my head. For Thou, O Lord, for Thou, O Lord, you are a shield for me. My glory. For thou, O Lord, for thou, O Lord, she are a shield for me. My glory, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. For thou, O Lord, for thou, O my wandering. Thou tellest my wandering. And if you came here tonight and you feel like you came here a wanderer, I want you to know that that which is wandering to you and maybe to many of us, sometimes they've looked at you and said, so what has he got you? Where has he got you? What has come out of it? Make it make sense. You know, sometimes you say, make it make sense. Make it make sense. And it looks like those that were cutting corners actually took a shortcut to some place. And it's like, you have taken the right route to nowhere. What can I say to you? He tells you're wondering. You 
see where all of this is going. You tell my wandering. And then he says, put thou my tears into thy bottle. <laughs> put my tears into your bottle. That th there, is a, there is a container. There is a container where God can and where God does store the tears of his people. That means that you can channel your tears actually to God. And when you do, God doesn't let them fall to the ground. You know, it is only here that they may appear to have fallen to the ground. But if those tears were channeled to God, their reality is collocated in the realm. It's like Jesus. When Jesus died, he was pierced and his blood poured out. If you were there that day, you'd have said, hey, they just wasted this man. They just wasted him. They just wasted his blood. But you know, there is a true tabernacle in the heavens at which Jesus is the high priest. The Bible says a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle that is in heaven, which the Lord pitched and not man. In that tabernacle, that blood that was thought to have wasted on the earth, it's actually, re, it's actually collected and Jesus offers it in the real tabernacle that is eternal in the heavens. That the tears you shed on earth, if you know how to convert things to their real spiritual materiality, the, God has a utility for your tears. God can collect your tears because he has a container where God puts them. Are you with me? So, instead of you to cry away, why not cry to the Lord? And, and listen to me. When I say cry to the Lord, I mean, I mean that your heart must learn how to connect with God even in your deepest pain and sorrow so that the tears that come from your eyes that sometimes the tears even flow unbidden. You only catch yourself. Teary. But if your heart was angulated towards the true north in the realm, what happens is that in the spirit, it, it, your tears are harvested. And when they are harvested, the Bible says that God puts them in his bottle. In his bottle. So you would think, oh, God has this store of tears. This treasury of tears. But you know what? The Bible says, are they not in thy book? What is the day? The tears. The tears. Again, trying to say the thing that has been said before. That when I cry and I shed tears, sometimes it is because there are no words to express the emotions that are juggling themselves within my being. And the, the, the freest expression that I can give to how I feel are the tears that stream down my face. If I have learned how to turn toward the true north in the spirit and I, and I release those tears, God does not only collect them and collocate them in a bottle. The Bible says God writes them in a book. Again, that means God is the one that can give legibility to your tears. Huh? When, when, when the tears is collected, God can actually tell what the tears said. In the world of men, we do text to speech, we do speech to tears, to text. God does tears to what? To text. It is tears to text. And I can tell you that the kingdom come, only God can do that. When you collect a man's tears and you put it in a bottle, take it to any lab, it, they can't bring it back to you on a piece of paper <laughs> that you can read, but God can. And I pray for you that you will never share the wasted tear after tonight. 
Because your tears can be the raw material with which God writes a developing story. And then five years down. So sometimes there will be things that God will come to respond to. And you say, your prayers are heard. And you say, sir, when did I pray it? And God said, no, you didn't pray. You didn't pray it. You teared it. You teared it. You teared it. I have come to respond to the wordings of the tears that you shed. Wordings that even you are not cognizant of. Because there are things that happen to us that are too deep for words. But he tells them. He tells our want and he can translate our tears. Don't ever let your tear go to waste anymore. It doesn't matter the background to the tear. Huh? If you want to weep, Jesus wept on the cross. But do you know how he wept? He said, my God! That changes everything. My God. I am in the midst of unspeakable, unbelievable pain. But you are mine. My God. My God. Whatever the enemy does to you, don't let him take God away from you. My God. My God. My God. Even when Jesus felt forsaken, he felt like God was the one that left him. Huh? But he hadn't left God. So he said, my, my, my God. Not my former God. My God. And he said, why have you forsaken me when you are still my God? My God. And you see, the moment you begin with my God, God can deal with whatever you put after it. Even if it were an accusation. Yes. Huh? So, so when, you are, you, when, you, when you get to the extremity of your life and you can only but cry tears. Let your tears cry my God. Whatever else they say. That simply means let your tears be addressed to God. Even if they are not directly addressed to God. Tear in God's presence. Huh? Situate yourself in God's presence before you start crying. There is, a, there is a receptacle that will be brought underneath you. And as the tears are dropping, they are collected. And then God puts them into a bottle. And then they apply divine intelligence, not artificial intelligence. And what you will have at the end will be a paragraph in a book that God himself preserves. Tears to text. So the next time that the enemy is trying to use your challenge as a reason for you to turn your back on God, that's how to be cheated twice. You are already going through a difficulty. And then Satan is now on top of the fact that you are going through a difficulty. Whatever good you should have been able to make out of it, Satan is also depriving you of that. God forbid. God forbid. That day, when David sat before the Lord and wept and wept and wept, we will stone you. He wept. All of them wept. But after weeping, the Bible said, and David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You can cry. Just make sure you cry in the right place. Are you with me? There are some persons that when you think of them, you have no words. Maybe a wayward son. A wayward daughter. An absentee father. And it breaks your heart. Your emotions are legit. I'm just saying, don't waste them. And you waste them when you express them behind God. I'd like for you to know that whatever it is that you are dealing with, God can deal with them. Are you with me? God can deal with them. 
So he says, put my, down my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? That book, that book, sometimes is a book of remembrance. That book, that book. And for a number of you, God opens that book tonight. Because the Lord says, I will remember. And I will remember that I'm a reward. I will remember. And I will remember that I'm a reward. I don't have the, 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 the space because we're not even, we are still looking at prayer points. We're on a journey to a feast of fat things. And I need you to know that that road can lead through some of the most unpleasant places. So while you are on the journey, don't think you are wondering. That was how it must have felt like for Joseph. But he was on a journey to destiny. And at some point it was like, he, you remember his brothers? When they saw him, they say, hey, behold the dreamer, the dreamer, the dreamer. And Joseph comes to them from wandering. That's how his story began. A man found him wandering. And I say, what is the problem? Hello, you remember? You remember? When they sent him to go look for his brothers, he did not find them in the usual place. And so one man found him wandering around. And the man asked him, why are you wandering around? What do you want? What do you seek? And he said he was looking for his brothers. And the man said, oh, I've heard them said, let's go to Dothan. So perhaps you should go that way. That was how he went towards Dothan. And as soon as they saw him coming from afar, they began to plot. So ah, the dreamer comes. The dreamer comes. So he comes to them. And somebody tells him you could go this way. And he took that way. He met his brothers. And then his brother said, let's kill him and see what we build of his dreams. So the first plan was kill him. Then later on, throw him into a well. They threw him into a pit. What they were thinking, thinking of execution. Then they see this caravan. Like, well, what are we going to profit if we kill our brother? He's our blood, nonetheless. But let's send him away. Let's send him away. So they sell the man, they sell the young man into slavery and take away from him his garment. So he's gone from wandering to being told the way and then to meeting his brothers who have said, we will kill him and then eventually, let's put him in a pit. Eventually, let's sell him. It's like nobody seemed to be able to make up their mind what the trajectory of this man's life should be like. And then the people who bought Joseph, huh? you remember? The, the guys that bought Joseph, the Ishmaelites that bought Joseph, you remember that Along the way, they also changed their mind. I can imagine that when they turned the guy around, when they looked at the way he was going, they said, this one is like he was spoiled from home. This is not going to be of much use in the labor market. Before the Ishmaelites got home, they sold him on the way. By the time you are looking at Joseph in the house of Potiphar, he was a second-hand slave. He was bought huh, from somebody that bought him. And the man that bought him did not even arrive home with him. The man changed his mind on the way. There is nothing that communicates worthlessness than that kind of thing. Like, how are you going to feel if the man had not even had a chance to put Joseph to work? So this was not a good... This wasn't a good deal. This was not a good investment. Before the guy dies on me, let's sell him. They sold him off in Egypt. In Nigeria, you will call Joseph a Tokumbo slave. It was Tokumbo. Fairly used. Fairly used. So, what can, if you were at that point, what would you be able to tell of this? This reading, this journey has no reading. 
it doesn't seem to have any purpose to it. It is almost as if things are just happening as they happen. He ends up in Potiphar's house. And then it looks like things just got a little brighter. And it's like, okay. In Nigerian English, they will say, at all, at all, not in bad. Like, well, if, if I cannot be the thing I saw in my dream, at least I'm not doing badly here. And before he will get used to it, he's accused. Falsely. For righteousness sake. And the troubling thing about Joseph going to prison is the fact that if you have read the story, I'm sure you would have noticed. Nobody knows how long Joseph was to be in prison. You know why? There was no proper judicial process. The man that put him in jail was a controller general of the prison services of Egypt. Joseph went from the house to jail. There was no judicial process. They didn't bring him before any judge. He was not tried. He was tried at home by his boss. And his boss sent him to jail. Which means that he, Joseph was going to be in jail for an indeterminate period of time. As long as Potiphar wished, Joseph was going to be in prison. You know, in my place, they used to say that when you have a guest whose departure date is known, it, it becomes easy to endure with his excesses. You just, you just go into your bedroom and be marking your calendar. See? Two more weeks, 12 more days, tomorrow. When he does another thing tomorrow, you just go to your room and cancel today. Say 11 more days, 11 more days. So you can be that nice guy because you know you have just 11 more days. Now imagine that you are in jail. When people come, people go and they're like, oh, what did you do? Joseph will say, don't worry. It's what it is. There are things I can't tell you about Joseph tonight. You know, Joseph, the man that Joseph sent into the palace, Joseph didn't tell him what actually happened. He simply said, for no fault of mine, I have been put here. He didn't even narrate this story. So, how long are you here for? Joseph cannot tell. What did you do? It looks as if Joseph cannot tell. Ah. Everybody comes into jail. Huh? With a jail term. Joseph went to jail without a jail term. But thou tellest my wandering. You tell my wandering. So somebody might be there and he say, how long is this season going to last? You may not know. But there's one who sits above the circle of the earth. He tells your wanderings. The psalmist says, my time are in your hands, O God. Thou tellest my wandering. So he's there. And he was going to be there as long as Potiphar pleased. Even Potiphar was not aware <laughs> that he was just part of a developing story. The real storyteller was God himself. And in an unexpected twist, Joseph became the man now that could determine if Potiphar lived or died. The startling thing about the story of Joseph, and the turnaround in the story of Joseph is that the day that Joseph, the first day that Joseph went to bed as a prime minister, that first day, he woke up that morning as a slave. Do you understand? Like, he woke up that morning a slave. And in that same day, that one day, that he woke up a slave with nothing having changed. Nothing changed when he woke up that morning. He woke up that day a slave. And he went to bed that same day in the night as prime minister over the world power of that time in one day. Thou tellest my wandering. Thou tellest my wandering. It is the day when God finally decides to unravel what he's been doing that you will now go backwards and you will say, 
Oh, that was why they didn't kill me. Oh, that was why the Ishmaelites did not like me. And if you imagine how much I struggled, I struggled with, you know, inferiority complex. For five years, because of what I heard in that caravan, as they dragged me along, the, the, the Ishmaelites, when they looked at me, looked at my face, looked at my skin, and all the things they said, how worthless I felt. God, so was this what you were doing? Ah, this was it. This was why the Ishmaelites didn't like me. How do you become prime minister from the hands of the Ishmaelites? So it, it was part of the story God was telling, the one dream of Joseph. That, so if only Joseph could trust. If Joseph could trust. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his love, what a glory he sheds on our way. When, he, when we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all who we trust and obey, trust and obey. For there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That even when you can't see him, you will trust him. Yes. Huh? This was it? Yes. That was why the Ishmaelite didn't like you. I was doing well in Potiphar's house. Is this why Madame came after me? Yes. Yes. I thought I did the right thing by standing for righteousness. And then I ended up in jail. And I heard the story. Why do good things happen to bad people? Why do good things happen to bad people? How do we define Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. Was it a bad thing now that Madame lied against me? Well, let's just say, thou tellest my wandering. What she did was wrong. But God was telling a story nonetheless. Even when the mighty think they are using their might of their own discretion, God is telling a story. Anything God does not change is because he can use it. Anything God does not change is because he can use it. The psalmist says, the wrath of man shall praise thee, and the remainder of wrath Thou shalt, what? Restrain. If you have the KJV, KJV, help me find. The wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath, thou shalt restrain. That means that the anger, the jealousy, the wrath of man, we praise God. Yes, surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath, thou shalt, what? Restrain. That means any part of the anger <laughs> and viciousness and wickedness of men that will not eventually praise God, God will restrain it. Whatever God cannot use, God will not allow. If God allowed it, he can use it. They were angry with Joseph. Let's kill him! No, 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 no. That is going too much. God restrained it. The remainder, the remainder of the wrath that will not praise God, God will restrain it. That was why, you know, it, it bothered me for so long. When I looked at the story of Jesus, I said, God, how is it that it is okay to kill Jesus and it's not okay to break his bones? What does it matter? He's going to die anyway. Do you remember? That his bones shall not be broken. So the wrath of man will praise God. They plan to kill Jesus. God said, ah, we can use this one. They said, we'll break his leg. Well, no, God said, we, we can't use this one. We won't allow it. You can kill him. You can't break his bones. 
Because the remainder, anything that is left of your wrath, that God can, that will not praise God, that will not bring praise to God in the end, God will not allow it to materialize. The wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder that will not praise, you will restrain it. And it may feel like a hard pill to swallow. But you may need to go like 13 years, like Joseph, to finally realize that God was telling his story. He was sold off at about 17. And he wouldn't become prime minister till he was 30. It was 13 years of confusing, conflicting reality. What I saw in the dream of the night is like my life is going in the exact opposite direction. And I'm saying that it kept going like that until the day that everything was going to change. The change was not gradual. He woke up that morning still a slave without a gem tail, without, without a term, a gem, a, a jail term. That same day. Hey, I forgot. Hey, this day I remember my offense. What is it? I met a man in prison. Okay. Is he still there? And they check. He's still there. So they go to bring him. Say, ah, no, the way you are, you can't appear before Pharaoh like this. So for the first time in a long time, they shaved him. He was coming only to come and tell a dream. But it was at least a breath of fresh air. I can breathe air that is not in the jail. Even if for a moment. Who would have told him? After that day, when the famine eventually came, if Potiphar will have food at home, he depended, depended on the generosity of Joseph to be able to feed. Joseph could have sent Potiphar back to the palace where he came from. But those are not my issues tonight. He didn't. Of course, you know he didn't. If I was Joseph, I would have at least done something. No, I wouldn't have sent the man, at least let's clear the air. Isn't it? You know, Joseph didn't. And there are times in your life, some of you, there are times in your life, there are cases you have felt the pressure of justice. See, let's set the record straight. Sometimes God will not even allow you. Because if I was Joseph, we call for a, we, we call for a review of the case and bring the wife of Potiphar to now actually tell the truth what happened. Wouldn't it be good to clear your name? Otherwise, otherwise the tale on the street is, this life is very, is, very, is very complicated. Imagine somebody going from wanting to rape his master's wife to become prime minister. What kind of word is this? So you would have said, God, let, just so that we can say, sometimes you will think it's for God's sake. But it is your ego you are trying to defend. And when God knows that, sometimes he will say, no, I, I've, been to those kinds, I've been in those kinds of places before. Where God will say to me, what's the problem? I said, no, it's for the sake of your name. <laughs> and, I, and I remember on one occasion, God said, am I complaining? <laughs> I was like, uh, this is not going to go well. <laughs> Am I complaining? I knew what that meant. Am I complaining? I'm like, well, I know you're not complaining, but I mean. So people will live with whatever misconception works for them. But God will still write straight with crooked lines. So Joseph didn't call the panel, didn't revisit the matter. Life went on like that. But Potiphar now had become the subordinate of the Joseph that he threw into jail without proper hearing. Huh? God knows how to turn tables like that. The other day it was Ruth. You know Ruth? 
Moabites, married to an Israelite, husband dies, no child. Now she's a widow and a childless widow for that matter. And on and on. Gets into Israel, tries to walk the fields. And she couldn't get a job as a reaper. If you know your, your scripture very well, you will know that she went to the field as a gleaner. She went to glean. Gleaning is for the least of the least. It's for those that are unemployed or unemployable. So the reapers reap. And how much the gleaners can make huh, depends on the incompetence of the reaper. Yes, because God says, when you go through a line, don't come back over it to pick up whatever you might have missed. So when you are harvesting your field, all right? So if you have very effective reapers, <laughs> there'll be very little for the gleaners to glean. Ruth came to that field as a gleaner. She was not even good enough, in quote, to get a, a valid job on the field. By the next farming season, she was coming to inspect the reapers. By the next farming season, Ruth was coming to the same field as owner of the field. The field that she was not qualified to be a reaper. The reaper was a salary earner. You worked for pay, and the owner of the field pays you. The gleaner was the, man, was the one that could not get employment. So whatever was left behind of the reapers, you just go and pick it up and gather it together so you can have something to eat. God made it a law so as to help the poorest of the poor that were in, it, in the land of Israel. That was root status last year. This year, she was the owner of the field. So the reapers that would have been looking at her strange girl from Moab last year. They now depend on her generosity to have a job this year. Because all it took was, I don't like your face. Please don't come back tomorrow. I want you to know that uh, serious labor laws such as you have in the UK did not exist in those days. You could be fired without any reason. Don't come back tomorrow. End of story. Who would have told Ruth? Who would have told Ruth? Who would have told Opa? The day that she went back. That this road could lead to the Messiah. Imagine every time people now say, Jesus, son of David. Imagine how Ruth felt in eternity. Hearing the sound of those words. Because she became the mother of Obed, who became the father of Jesse, who became the father of David, the father of the Christ. Jesus, son of David. That was Ruth's grandson. Thou tellest my wanderings. I want you to bring, you know, where I come from, where I come from. When people die, in the obituary announcement, you say, uh, with pain in our heart, but total submission to the will of God, we announce the passing of our dear brother. And my concern used to be, if you didn't want to submit to the will of God, what would you have done? <laughs> total submission to the will of God. As if <laughs> your lack of submission could change the status of the dead. If you submit to the will of God, the man is dead. If you say, we not go agree, oh, we not go agree. The man is still dead. But you know, this evening, you can actually bring total submission that has a meaning. And I'm going to ask you to pray for a moment before, after that prayer, then I start to minister to you. 
There is a sense in which many of us, you have begrudged God for so long. You begrudge God. God, where were you? Where were you? The same place he was when Jesus was nailed to the cross. Huh? If you want to know where God is, when bad things happen to good people, find out where he was when Jesus was nailed to the cross. Same place. Three dark nights. Three dark days. The dividends have lasted for more than 2,000 years. Even if you, you were Jesus, when you look back 2,000 years, huh? will you not say, huh? God, I didn't understand that time. But now I see it was worth it. Don't you think it was worth it? No, talk to me. If you were Jesus by today, wouldn't you have thought that those three days were worth it? But those were three days of unbelievable, unspeakable, excruciating pain and shame. His disciples were distraught. His apostles were, dis they were disoriented. They said, but we thought he was the one that was going to save us. Ah, we thought, we thought. They were confused. Nothing made sense anymore. Lasted for three days. Might be three years. For you, might be three months. I don't know how long for Joseph it was 13 years. But I can tell you, he knows you're wondering. He can tell you're wondering. And the day breaks, as the songwriter says, we shall understand it better by and by. A day will break over your head when you will look back and you will feel so terrible that you felt terrible. Do you understand? When you look back, you will feel terrible that you felt terrible. Like, but God, you would have told me. And this is where we are going. Then God will say, but I told you to trust me. I told you to trust me. And I need you to know that God is not under any obligation to respond to your tantrums. Are you there? So I want you to bring total submission to the will of God this evening. And the reason is because of what I will say to you after we are done praying. You want to be in a healthy place in your interactions with the Lord. You don't want your heart to be agitated. And you do not want to begrudge God. You know what I mean by begrudging God? Huh? Don't, don't, don't keep malice with God. You know, some of you, there's a corner in your heart where you have set yourself as God's instructor. And the unspoken, the, unspoken, the unspoken tone of that corner of your heart, the unspoken posture of that corner of your heart is you are querying the wisdom of God. It's like saying, God, it, as if, it, if you really had sense, you know, you wouldn't have allowed this and this and this to have happened like this. But you know, you are not going to say with your mouth. But that's the orientation of your heart. You're like, but God, there's a better way to have handled this. Thing. And I used to think that you were better than this. That's what your heart is saying. That's what your heart is saying. That's the thing I'm trying to ask you to turn it around and submit it to the Lord. Huh? The reason is because God can tell your wondering. And a day will break. When it will all make sense. Are you with me? The apostles stood that day and they said, This same Jesus has God made both Lord and Christ. What a day that was. This same Jesus. That by wicked hands you took and killed. They said, This same Jesus has God made both Lord and Christ. But you know that day he denied Jesus. When the tables turned, he became the evangelist. Don't, don't, don't begrudge God. Because God can write straight, even with crooked lines. So you want to bring a certain level of submission to the will of God. Huh? In two minutes, I want your heart, I want you to return everything, everything that held a grudge against God. 
everything that murmured against the wisdom of God. You want to bring it back. I want you to pray this prayer with. Every ounce of sincerity that you are capable of mustering. And ask for help where it is beyond your power. There is no way I can see how you can bring anything good out of what I'm going through. But Lord, Lord, despite my inability to make sense of it, I choose to trust. Even when I cannot trail you, I choose to trust. I choose to trust. I choose to trust. Blessed are those that trust in him. I choose to trust. Jesus does not only know the way through the wilderness. Jesus is the way through the wilderness. When Israel wandered through the wilderness, there was a rock that followed them. And the Bible said that rock was Christ himself. He was the rock that followed Israel during the 40 years of their wandering. It was a rock. It was a rock. But that rock was Jesus. Jesus does not only know the way, he is the way. And tonight, I want you to take another 90 seconds to just try, try, try trusting. Try trust. Try trust. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I am. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender. Oh, to him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. Jesus, I. Oh Lord, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. Jesus, I. Surrender all, all to Thee, O oh Lord, my blessed Savior. I one more time. I surrender. I surrender all. Jesus, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior. Say to Him, if that's your decision tonight I surrender when I understand I surrender 
when I don't understand I surrender withholding nothing withholding nothing I surrender everything to you withholding nothing you have 30 seconds more can you talk to him can you talk to him even when I can't see you I will trust you when I can't trail you I will trust you my times are in your hands oh God my times are in your hands My times are in your hands. And nothing is lost that is put in your care. My times, they are in your hands. Efena somina fatia la mombre katamia tuberana sole monaha. Ofes kabra fote saleni kataro naskabomela. Ebani na kutela so se verite kapa. Li ke penatila. I surrender. I surrender. Even so, help me, Jesus. Even so, help me, Lord. Help us. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hallelujah. All right, so now I think you're at a place where I can pray for you. Isaiah chapter 25. Verse 6. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things. A feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees, well refined. I want you to go one book before this book, Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Keep the thought in your heart from Isaiah 25. In Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, I'm the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Verse 4. He brought me. He brought me. He brought me. He brought me to the banqueting house. And his banner over me was love. So let's look at verse 3. Because verse 3 introduces us to this person that prepares a feast of fat things. Verse 3 says, As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so, so is my beloved among the sons. And it says, I sat down under his shadow with great delight. So, at least you get a sense that the person who is speaking here is a lady. There are two principal uh, characters in Song of Solomon, a male and a female. And the male calls the female my love principally, and then the female calls the male my beloved. But then from the pronouns here, you can tell that it's the lady who is speaking. And the lady says, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. So, among sons... The one that is mine is like the apple tree among all the other trees of the wood. I don't have time. I sat down under his shadow with great delight. With great delight. And his fruit was sweet. But in context, it was sweet. How? To my taste. That means irrespective of what others might say about his fruit, to my taste, it is sweet. There's an objectivity here and there's a subjectivity here. 
that you must decide that so long as it comes from Jesus, it is sweet. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. If it is his fruit, it is sweet. Are you there? If you wake up tomorrow morning and Jesus says, don't ever taste soda anymore. It's sweet. Even if it is bitter sweet, it's still sweet. It's his fruit. So long as it is his, she said his fruit is sweet to my taste. But I need you to realize that because she calls him like the apple tree, there is only fruit to be expected. And there is only one fruit to be expected. What fruit would that be? Apple. Imagine what life under an apple tree must look like. And that's why I came here. Because there's a transition that is about to take place in the next 10 minutes. It's a relocation. We said it's a feast of fat things. But I need you to realize that that's not, even in Isaiah chapter 25, that was not where they began. Go and read. They began with the arrogance of the Babylonians. And the Israelites had been trodden on their feet. And they were talking about a future day when the Messiah will eventually bring consolation and solace to his people that have been trodden down by the, by the Babylonians and when the Lord now finally deals with them. They were going to come from a place of being the underlings and suddenly they will enter into a banquet, a feast of fat things. His fruit was sweet to my taste. His fruit was sweet to my taste. If it is the apple, it's got fruit. And if it is the apple, it's got only one fruit. And the fruit is apple. And for a long time, a long time, by in context, this young lady, all that she knew was apple. 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 In this scenario, there's usually no question of asking, what will you have for lunch? Because it's apple. Dinner, apple. Day two, breakfast, apple, lunch, dinner, lunch, and dinner, apple. Week two, apple. Even for the Israelites, a day broke. Huh? When they murmured against a miracle, because it became monotonous. They called it manna. Manna came from heaven. The first day manna fell, it was a beautiful, glorious thing. But when manna continued, manna ring and manna ring every day, after a while, they came to Moses and said, Sir, with due respect, where this thing is coming from? Is this the only thing there? Can't, can't we have something different for a change? And they murmured. They murmured against a miracle that once upon a time they celebrated because it had become monotonous. Even 21st century man still says that variety is the spice of life. But this lady said, I sat down under his shadow with great delight, never taking him for granted. And there are some of you I came to say to you tonight that God has watched your time under the apple tree. God has watched your conduct under the apple tree. And for some of you, I bring you wisdom. Because you, your term under the apple tree is but for a while. And Abba will come for inspection. And the inspection is to the end that you might transition. Yeah. I sat down under his shadow with great delight. And his fruit was sweet to my taste. And as long as I was there, I kept eating the same thing. No complaint. And even the lady would have thought that this was all that there was. And surprise of all surprises. You know what happened? The next verse. She said, he brought me. From where? Under the apple tree. He brought me from that place. To where? Not to a mango tree. He brought me from under a tree. Into a house. A house of banquet. Into the banqueting house. And the flags that flew in that place was love. And you might be tempted to say, what kind of a man are you? So you have this kind of place. 
and you left me under an apple tree for 32 years. Yes. Because the part of the joss is like the shining light that shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. You know, last week I was in Makodi with the Adulam student. And the, 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 the event, the, the Adulam people are now using the hall that we used as the tent before. And as I stood there with this Adulam meeting, I, you know, it just occurred to me. Like, we preached, it was the best in its day. We preached out our lives on that platform. When I stood in this place and I'm speaking to the students, I'm looking at this auditorium. You know, I was smiling a different kind of smile. It's only me that knew what was going on in my mind. That hall can probably take like 250, like 250 people for years. For years. For years. When several of you heard the voice of Apostle Aram, it was from that small hall. And you will never know your banqueting hall huh? until you prove yourself under the apple tree. And I came tonight to say to you, I, 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 I came tonight to bring you something that is made in heaven. Huh? And in four minutes, two for each. Two for each. Two for each. Two minutes for each. Two minutes. Because God is about to set something before men and women especially those that have stayed faithfully under the apple tree. You have known leanness. You have managed. But you have not denied God in all of it. God is about to take your hand from under a tree and suddenly a door will open. And wonder of wonders. When you walk through that door and you turn back, you will see your name written across behind it. For you, my love, and then your name will be at the end. I want you to stand to your feet. Four minutes. Two for each. The first two minutes, you and I are going to split it. You are going to take one of it. And you are going to ask Jesus to take your hand. Huh? And bring you to the feast. He said, he brought me. He brought me. There's a place you cannot come unbidden. He brought me. It is the Lord himself that makes upon this mountain a feast of fat things. It is God that makes it. And you can't come without him. And your one minute has 50 seconds left. <laughs> can you ask him, take my hand and bring me. Bring me. Bring me. Bring me. Bring me to the feast that only you can make. Only you can make. I don't know where you're watching from and I don't know what your status is in the UK. You may have seen many beautiful things and many wonderful things. But I'm talking about a feast that the Lord himself makes. The Lord will make for all people a feast of fat things. Can you ask that the Lord... By the power by which he's able to compel everything to line up with his will. Can you ask? Take my hand. Bring me, bring me, bring me, bring me, bring me to the feast. That you have made for me for such a time as this. You have 20 seconds left. Bring me. Bring me. Bring me. Bring me. Bring me. Bring me. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. This is when you need those ears that are prophetic and that heart that is of faith. I said in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, hear me now. Hear me now. Lord, everyone tonight that is due for a transition, and there are many of them, many of them, many of them, I 
came to announce to you London a change of seasons. A change of seasons. A change of seasons. A change of seasons. The weather, the climate over you changes. I came to announce a change of seasons. There will be drastic, 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 drastic changes that will happen to the circumstance of people in the next three months. A change of seasons. A change of seasons. There are quite a number of you that I already see God holding your hand. Holding your hand. I'm bringing you across a threshold. It's like when you're crossing from outside, inside. And the Lord takes your hand and is crossing you from outside to inside. And it is a picture of coming from under the apple tree into a feast of fat things, into the banqueting hall. The Lord will take your hand and the Lord will bring you across. Now, I need you to know you don't need to fall. You will receive it in your spirit. Because there is at least 17 people that are about to transition drastically and miraculously. The Lord takes your hand and the Lord brings you across the threshold. He 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 brings you across the threshold. I don't know whether on site or online, I, online, but I hear the name Gladys, Gladys, Gladys. And the Lord says to say to you, weep no more. Because you will see, you will see my wonder in the next 14 days. You will see my wonder in the next 14 days. Spirit of the living God. I'm asking, oh Lord, that we propel every one of the 17 and more into the next things, into the next things, into the next things. And now I declare in the word of the Lord, transition, 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 transition. I bring you a push by the mercy of the Lord tonight. Transition! 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 I bring you a push from heaven that shifts you into the next things the next seasons from under the apple tree to the banqueting hall transition and finally anyone under the sound of my voice that suffers from an ailment in the body God brings you into a lush place the oil the balm of Gilead brings you relief now. Online and on site, I declare healing from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. It will happen swiftly in the next 30 seconds. You are healed. You are healed. You are healed. Asthma is gone. Arthritis be gone. Long-sightedness, short-sightedness, Go in the name of Jesus. I speak strength to your bones. Life to your kidneys. Life to your lungs. Life to your liver. Life to your intestines. Live in the name of Jesus. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, you are healed. You didn't hear me? I say you are healed. 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 And I declare tonight that of the increase of the government and the peace of God over you, there will be no end. In the next three months, there will be testimonies in this house. Jaw-dropping testimonies. I am talking to you about things that you have no framework for imagining right now. Outstanding, startling, unbelievable interventions of mercy in the name of Jesus. 
you are blessed in your spirit in your soul in your body everything that concerns you is perfected so it is decreed so it is established in Jesus mighty name God bless you